lone sailor, shipwrecked in the middle of the ocean. I didn't think there was any way I was gonna live more than a couple of weeks. A desperate struggle for food and water. It's kind of like living like a caveman. Days turned into weeks. No sign of land, no hope of rescue. If the thought occurred to me, maybe I'm just doomed to drift forever out here. 11 weeks at sea in a raft. This is the ultimate survival story. A truly epic fight to survive. In the wild, when things go bad, they go bad fast. Without warning, your life can hang by a thread. Adventurer and survivor Craig DiMartino fought back from his own wilderness disaster to reclaim his life. Now Craig meets other courageous outdoorsmen who beat the odds and return from their own fight to survive. I'm Craig DiMartino. There are a few stories in the history of survival tales as powerful as Steve Callahan's. Being lost at sea is not just a struggle against the elements, but a fight that plays out in the deep recesses of the human mind. It's a place where loneliness and despair can grow to become enemies far greater than hunger, thirst, or predators from the deep. March 19th, 1982. Steve Callahan has been adrift in the middle of the Atlantic for 43 days. He's so far out to sea that he's beyond the range of any effective search by ship or aircraft. His sailboat sank after hitting a large object in the dark. As it went down, he made it into his emergency raft with a limited amount of food, water, and useful survival tools. An experienced sailor with an iron will and belief he would survive. He used every bit of knowledge and skill to stay alive. But on the 43rd day, everything changed. A gash in the side of the rubber tube threatened to sink the raft. Steve tried, but couldn't stop the crippling leak. Craig DiMartino had to face his own dark moments as he laid on the ground with his leg shattered. Craig asked Steve what he was feeling as he struggled to stay alive. That was the low point. I wasn't going any further. Out of steam, physically, emotionally, mentally, and then it was clear that, you know, this was all for naught. I just, like, I just spent the last month and a half or whatever just struggling and I'm not gonna be able to get back and fix anything and I'm gonna die here and all my past sins are gonna remain and I can't do anything about it. But then it became, do I have enough energy in me? Do I have enough wherewithal to actually get myself together enough to give it one more go? For Steve, that week had started like so many others. My routine was pretty fixed. I would wake up, look around to the whole horizon, making sure there's no ship out there. If I had anything to eat, I would, you know, have breakfast. And then I would do exercises, and I would fish if fish were around. Fishing meant waiting patiently with his small spear gun for just the right moment to strike. At first, I was using it as a conventional spear gun, shooting at the fish. And very soon after I started using it, I went to reload the spear in it, and the strap had disappeared. Without the spear gun, without a way to get fish, Steve would starve. With some of the line in the survival kit, he meticulously lashed the spear to the stock. But that's not how it's made to be used. Usually straight through and then you're pulling on the spear, it's in tension. But if I've got this fish on the end of it, there's a lot of load on this tiny little shaft, so it's often bending it. A lot of twisting, so I'm having to improve the lashing system. Survival demanded keen attention to the most minute details. It's lots of teeny, teeny, teeny little detail, like every little thing is important. And also trying to be careful, careful, careful that I don't lose anything else. 
next thing that happened, I finally spear another Dorado, and it does this kind of like little twirly, 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 and swims off, and I'm, I pick up the end of the spear, and I'm just amazed because it's unscrewed the spear tip and gone. With the survival kit knife, Steve jerry-rigged a new point for the spear. The improvised weapon proved a lifesaver. Sharks would come, and they would often bump the raft just to see if there's some kind of a reaction. And that's kind of how I dealt with sharks, was to think that they were like most predators, that if you pose a threat to them, they're less likely to cause you problems. So whenever one would come along, even though I knew I couldn't really hurt it, I would jab at it with a spear. If I got a couple of good hits on it, it would go away. On day 43, Steve prepared to fish again. That afternoon, he waited patiently over the edge of the raft. A Dorado swam by, and Steve speared it. Then the big fish twisted wildly toward the raft. This time it broke the shaft of the spear and kind of turned around and ran against the raft. Instantly, the raft's lower tube deflated. Air gushed from the six-inch tear. With the bottom tube deflated, the water pressure would push up in the inside so that it was like this dome on the inside of rubber. And if I step in it, it's like being in rubber quicksand, which I was worried about my legs sticking down in the water and sharks and stuff grabbing that. Steve's whole world quickly crumbled around him. It made it really hard to tend to the solar still almost impossible to fish. And it also gave me only about this much freeboard. So any even minor waves were washing in and out of the raft. I was wet all the time, and it was, it was miserable. He knew the first big wave could swamp the raft, and that would be the end. It was just such a stark thing. So I pulled myself up and I went through this really intense mind game of what I had in the raft, what could possibly fix this repair. He didn't have any adhesive patches big enough to cover the hole. So he squeezed the ripped rubber edges together like puckered lips on a mouth and tightly wrapped them with line. I tried external pressure patches and trying harder and harder to tie it tight. Nothing worked, so I went through this for 10 days, 24-7, just trying to deal with this leak, and it just completely exhausted me, and I finally just kind of collapsed back in the raft, and I thought that was it. The raft was barely afloat and still a 1,000 miles from land. Steve hadn't been able to fish and restock his food supply. The solar distillation still had quit working, and he was nearly out of drinking water. I remember feeling really sorry for myself again, breaking down and feeling the water kind of washing in and out of the raft and just feeling my life just ebbing away. For 10 days, Steve Callahan struggled to stop the leak that plagued his raft. None of his fixes worked. Maybe I can get myself together enough to have one more shot at this. If I don't get my act together here now, this one time, I wasn't just talking about the remote possibility now that this, this is a matter of hours away. I'm gonna be dead, that's all there is to it. And then it dawned on me, ah, oh, I know what I need to do. As often as the case, in order to fix a problem, you often have to make them worse. His new plan required that he make the hole even bigger. He also needed to sacrifice the stainless steel eating utensils from his survival kit. I can use those as pins. I broke the handle off of a, a fork, and then I cut slits in the top and the bottom of the lips. And I put the foam tongue in, and I drove that pin down through the whole thing. And then behind it, I could wind lashings and make them really tight. And then it didn't matter how much pressure was in the raft. The line and everything couldn't be forced off because it was being held by that, by that pin. With the hand pump, Steve reinflated the raft. The repair worked. The raft was stable again. Even though I felt really proud of myself for coming up with the answer, I'm also berating myself for being so stupid I couldn't have figured it out like a week beforehand. With the repair complete, 
Steve focused on restarting the neglected solar still and restocking his food supply. I got pretty skinny and it was very interesting to me to see what happened to my body because all the fat goes first and all those bits of your body that you're not using a lot. So, you know, the rear end's gone. Don't need that. Legs got really, really skinny, even though I could stand up in the raft and tried to, you know, like holding on to it. And it was kind of like, a bit like walking on water. <laughs> but I, I got pretty good at it after a while. And my legs were strong enough to keep me up, but they were pretty thready by the end of it, you know, sort of knobby knees. My upper body, which I used the most, my body reserved the most strength for. So it, it remained in fairly decent shape compared to the rest of me. Steve caught enough of the large Dorados and other small fish to keep himself from starving. But without any fruits or vegetables, scurvy might kill him. There was always that nagging of being hungry, always. I found it very interesting that every time I slept that I would dream of foods and drinks. But I never dreamt of steak or fish. It was always beautiful breads and fruit and all the stuff that my body needed. A tangle of kelp floated by. Steve plucked it from the water and ate what he could to get some critical vitamins and to supplement his monotonous diet of fish. As time went on, I became much more interested in what was inside the fish than the flesh. The fish eyes, which were nuggets of fluid uh, between the vertebrae, all those little discs, they were kind of fluid-like. Fresh fish liver, heart, all those things inside the fish which were providing me with vitamins and minerals and fats. He couldn't eat an entire fish in one sitting, so he devised a way to stockpile the meat, his own fish jerky. They'd be roughly one inch square sections by, you know, however long and I'd hang them up in all these strings which would dry in the sun and so sometimes they would keep for a really long time. Aside from extreme weight loss, Steve suffered unavoidable saltwater sores. They start as like little bumps on the skin, turning these kind of pimples that end up opening up. So you have an open ulcer, much like a canker sore or something like that. It forms on the skin and they tend to be in places where you're wet a lot and compress, like hips, but I would end up with hundreds of these all over me, and they're very painful because, first of all, they're open ulcers, and secondly, I'm living in a salt-encrusted environment. After 60 days adrift, the raft was stable, and Steve was winning his fight against starvation. But he feared another battle, an even more difficult challenge was looming on the horizon. Every day for the last eight weeks, Steve Callahan had managed to plot his approximate location. He had measured his speed, and he'd kept a log of how far west the currents had been carrying him. He estimated he was still four or five weeks away from making landfall somewhere in the Caribbean. As the days turned into weeks, the effort to survive each day surprisingly grew a bit easier. I was surviving literally in a rubber tent in the middle of a wilderness fishing for a few hours a day. And I just became starkly aware of how much of our lives are spent dealing with all this stuff that we don't really need, that we want, but we don't really need. And yet the irony is that the things that mean the most to me don't come from them anyway. Through the entire voyage, I think that's something that helped me quite a lot, was to recognize, at least intellectually, even if I wasn't having a good time, that there were these wonders around me. At night, I would stand up and I'd look out and all the fish would be kind of hovering under the raft, just pacing along, and each one, you could see their entire shape as they would go through this glittering underwater thing like silver platters. It sounds like a simple thing, but for me in that position at that time, it was like touching God or something. With no one to share his thoughts, Steve jotted down his observations in his small notebooks. I wrote in the log, to me, this is a view of heaven from a seat in hell. For this little me, Stephen, I was in pain and I was suffering and I was dying, but there was this other part, this very open, expansive spiritual part. I feel spiritually touched by nature where one is confronted directly with one's insignificance. I feel truly humbled in the seat certainly does that, and in the life raft, it was that times a million. The loneliness took a toll, 
but companionship would have come with a deadly price. I longed for people most of the time, but I was also aware that had I had somebody with me that one or the other of us or both of us would have died because I just didn't have enough water for the two of us. After nearly two months, the freshwater solar still had slowly deteriorated. But the raft had drifted closer to the Caribbean and the skies filled with welcome rain. Steve rigged the scrap of survival blanket as a rain collection system. Early on, my equipment was all working pretty well. You know, I, yeah, I had to pump up the raft a lot and stuff like that, but basically it was, it was okay. The raft itself was guaranteed by the manufacturer to hold together for 40 days. Steve was already weeks past that expiration date. Would the waterproofing and the glued seams hold the raft together long enough for Steve to reach land? I started going through this period where I was going, maybe I'm like a flying Dutchman. Maybe I'm dead. Maybe this is what I deserve for all my past, you know, sins. If the thought occurred to me, like, maybe I'm just doomed to drift forever out here. Steve Callahan's raft was slowly crumbling. His solar water still finally gave out. And by day 75, it looked like he'd never be rescued. But then, the gentle current brought him a glimmer of hope. As far as the eye can see, I came upon these tangles of trash and weed, sargassum weed and other kinds of weed. It was all bundled up and, and just going forever. And Although as horrible as that was, it, for me, it was a fantastic sign. I'm on the edge of something. Steve had reached the edge of the shipping lanes, routes trafficked by freighters crisscrossing the Caribbean Sea. On the 75th night, I got up and I looked out, and there were kind of like these little glows on the horizon, and there were several of them. I was really getting more and more jazzed up, like, hmm, this is something. There's, that, they might not be boats. They might actually be something on land. And then finally, I saw the, what was the loom of a lighthouse definitively, because there was a pulse and a, a pause and a pulse pulse, and it repeated over and over and over again. So the next morning, I expected to kind of get up and maybe see something way off in the distance. But actually, it was pretty close. I could see details on the land. I could see that there was an island right in front of me, and then I heard an engine. And it's getting closer and closer and closer. And I look out, and I see these fishermen coming out to me. come up to the boat and they're talking some kind of language. I don't know what it is. I, I, I can, really can't figure it out. It's not really Spanish. It's not French. What is it? Well, it turns out it's Creole, and I'm not understanding a word of it. <laughs> we load the raft up on the bow of the boat and roar into the island. The fishermen sped Steve to the tiny island of Marie Gallant. To Steve's good luck, the currents had drifted him to the easternmost of the Caribbean islands, just south of Guadeloupe. In 76 days, he drifted nearly 2,000 miles. They come up towards the beach, and I'm so excited. You know, here's land, here's land, and there's a beautiful beach. I immediately just fall flat on my face on the beach. <laughs> These two local guys just grab me by the arms and they just like lift me up and take me up to the local gendarme and sit me in a metal chair and somebody thrusts a cold ginger beer in my hand which was like, oh my God, this is so heaven. <laughs> 
helpful locals delivered Steve to the hospital, where he was looked after for a few days. He contacted his parents that he was safe. Drawing from his pencil logs of the 76-day journey, Steve wrote a book titled Adrift. His vivid retelling caught the attention of film director Ang Lee. Lee talked with Steve and asked him for his input and advice on his 2012 film about a young man's struggle to survive a shipwreck, The Life of Pi. Some of the gifts that I feel like I was given from the voyage, I found that I was a lot stronger and more adaptable than I thought I was, which is certainly important. But actually, the equal gift was being confronted by all my failures and shortcomings. I think that was a real gift. It gave me a chance to come back and try to make things a little better. The ocean and sailing almost killed you. You didn't wait that long, it jumped right back on a boat. People don't stop doing what they're doing right. because they have an accident. The bottom line is, is that even though I went through this kind of horrible experience, um, I gained so much from it. I tell people that too, I wouldn't change it, I wouldn't take it back, I wouldn't want to go through it again. Yeah. Same idea, but what I've learned and seen, I would have not seen and learned. Yeah. You know, I would have probably just kept doing what I was doing. People, I think, in society want they don't want, they don't they like want more security. They, they, like they want to get rid of that risk. You know, everybody suffers in life. Everybody goes through crises. Um, and if I was the 62-year-old Steve and I knew the 29-year-old Steve was going to go and have this experience and it was going to be really hard for him, but all the stuff that he would gain from it in the long run, it'd be like, go for it. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to tell you what happens. Be prepared. It ain't going to be easy, but you know, you're going to just, you're just going to have this amazing experience and it's going to take you down a lot of roads you could never have imagined.